Nigeria set a plan to help startups raise their total yearly funding rounds to $5 billion by the year 2027. And this was disclosed by the Minister of Communications, Innovation and Digital Economy, Dr. Bosun Tijani, on Monday in a document titled Accelerating Our Collective Prosperity Through Technical Efficiency, a Strategic Plan for the Federal Ministry of Communications, Innovation and Digital Economy. The minister stated that the primary objective is to stimulate the growth and sustainability of startups, though patient uh, capital is one of the things that would also be considered. So joining me this morning in Lagos, uh, Nigeria's economic capital is Olusheyi Awujudube, Senior Analyst, SBM Intelligence. Olusheyi, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you very much for having me. Good morning. Now, the number of startups in Nigeria was estimated to have exceeded about 3,360 in 2022, the highest number in Africa. Uh, it was actually followed by Kenya, uh, South Africa, and the likes, with uh, 1,000 and over 660 startups in the same year. So what do you believe are the enduring factors to the birth and the growth of startups in Nigeria? Thank you for the question. One thing that has continued to encourage other startups to spring up across Nigeria and Africa is the success that others have enjoyed. And so when, when people see that the previous, the forerunners have, have enjoyed large, large success, they are encouraged to create their own tech solutions and start their own companies. Also, we can't take away the fact that Nigeria has a huge unemployment problem and tech, the tech industry seems like a safe place for that that is willing to absorb youths who have the skills. And so it is also it's also that people who are unemployed are seeking employment, are seeking ways to create wealth, are seeking ways to create job opportunities for other youths and also find a solution to social problems that are life in Nigeria. Yes, talking about um, unemployment, uh, the number of new startups in Nigeria increased by 35% in the past three years, according to reports. And Lagos alone, that is the commercial capital and the economic hub, witnessed a 45% growth in startup registrations last year. So what have been their contributions to providing tech-based solutions, job creation, as you have mentioned, and of course, revenue growth um, to the country? A number of these startups in Lagos are enjoying the work, if I may put it, that the previous or the foreigners have done. We know about how the Yaba, Yaba has been built to be like Nigeria's Silicon Valley. And so anyone who is interested in creating a tech solution can access hubs that have been created, like you mentioned, like the Minister of Digital Economy, Dr. Bosu Tijani, has created with CC Up, and we have other, other um, tech companies that have created this ecosystem. And so Lagos would naturally enjoy the concentration of these startups because of the infrastructure that is available in Lagos. And like I said earlier, youths, who have the skills, uh, the tech industry is willing to absorb them. And so this is why we see a large concentration of these tech startups in Lagos. Uh, okay, now uh, five markers uh, were highlighted as the component of a stronger digital economy. Now, the Minister for Communications, Innovation and Digital Economy talked about knowledge, policy, innovation, infrastructure, and uh, entrepreneurship or trade. Uh, you've talked about um, the infrastructural part of it. How critical are these to the growth of startups, most especially in Nigeria? Because we're also looking at scaling it up from Lagos to other parts of the country, like Abuja and all our other high-end um, states in the country. So how critical are these, um, are these parameters in scaling up and growing the digital economy in the country? The, these five pillars that you, are, that you have mentioned are very critical. They are things that are needed if we are interested or if we are serious about building a great or a huge startup space that can rival those that we see in China and India and even in the US. 
And so if for infrastructure, infrastructure, for example, we know the infrastructure that is available in Yaba in Lagos, and we are hoping that um, this is where policy comes in. We're hoping that other states can replicate and create something like this so that people can, or youths in their region, in their states can take advantage and innovate. Having, which is which speaks to the innovation leg, and also when they have the skills, so they use their knowledge to innovate and policy, one of which is the right of way that, that um, telecommunication companies have to get in states. So these, and of course, that would, policy will help to build the infrastructure. Mm. or will give the room for infrastructure to grow. And youths who have the knowledge will be able to innovate. So as you can see, they are all linked and they, they are what is needed or what are needed to build an ecosystem that of tech startups. Now, I'm talking about um, African startups. Uh, now, we, we also understand that about um, $5.4 billion dollars was raised in capital um, in 2022. And um, the Nigerian minister has come out to say that he's hoping to raise about $5 billion um, in venture capital. Do you think that will be enough? Is that feasible to even start with? And do you think that will be enough to drive growth um, within Nigeria's um, tech startups uh, uh, ecosystem? Talking about the feasibility, no one has a crystal ball. <laughs> so. We can't say whether it is feasible or not, but what we know is that we have investors who are willing to invest their money and pitch their tents with innovators, who are, which are the tech startups. There, there is that already. And so asking if the $5 billion, that, the $5 billion target that the minister has set will be enough, we, we don't exactly know the size of the market. So we can't say what will be enough or not be enough, but we know that it would be a good place to start. We know that states and regions in Nigeria and tech innovators in Nigeria will be able to leverage on this. They'll be able to get a part of this and build or scale up in cases where they, are, they have already built. And even for people who have not even started getting the skills, we know that if such a fund is available, the states can create or with private sector, with the help of private sector, they can create training centers where people can gain knowledge of tech skills. Hmm. Now, according to um, Africa, the big deal, which is actually an African funding data inside firm, now they said that uh, amid a funding drought, Nigerian startups uh, were, uh, were able to raise $1.2 billion last year. And now um, the minister, that is Tijani, said he hopes to increase funding through the local availability of patient capital. Now, how critical and potent is the role of patient capital in the growth of startups, owing to the fact that this is actually a long-term investment in the form of debt and equity? So, like the word already says, patient capital, mm. it means that they, they are really, they're willing to stick with you, they're willing to stand by you in whatever challenges that you may encounter, whatever you may you may you may be building. So we we patient capital is is needed. It's it's something that when tech companies or tech innovators have access to this, they are no longer they will no longer be in a rush to raise funds. You know, when they when they typically raise get seed funding or get um, complete a funding round, they're in a rush to spend it and launch some products so that they can quickly go on another funding round. And so when they have access to patient capital, I mean, when they have access to patient capital, they are able to properly weigh and build such that they can build products that can fit into the environment and not just duplicate what other people are, are doing. Well, aside the fact that um, they don't have to pitch or create a product that is needed uh, within a particular market, are there other challenges that you would consider or you'd want to highlight that could be an impediment for these startups to get the kind of funding that can boost their franchise? Well, 
you know, earlier we were talking about the policy pillar. Policy is one one um, one part that the Nigerian tech ecosystem needs and needs to improve on. And we hope that the situation will get better now that Dr. Basuti Jani, who is the Minister of Digital Economy, is well known in the tech cycle in tech circles. And so what what we know is that if the government um if the government and if the economy were to be stable, Nigerian Nigerian tech startups will be able to have access to some funding from other from some other clients that Nigeria is currently blacklisted in. They would also not have to convince investors of the macroeconomic situation in Nigeria. So if if things were stable, if the environment was stable, if they know that they have government backing such that we don't have policy, how do I put it now, policy change over constant change in policy, which will which can basically shut down a company. You know, we've had we've had times that just one policy from the government and an entire company has to either remodel their operations or be shut down totally, shut down operations totally. So if the policy arm were to be strengthened, then tech innovators will know that they don't have to, they don't have to deal with convincing investors about Nigeria's macroeconomic environment. Now, there's this um, saying that um, he who pays the piper dictates the tune. And that brings me to this uh, next question. Are there enough guidance of laws or policies that help prevent hostile takeovers and may also protect founder of Nigerian and African startups by investors? Because we know that uh, most times when investors um, plow their fund into a particular uh, business or a startup, as the case may be, they would always want to have influence in terms of the trajectory and the decision-making process of these uh, startups, which may derail the overall vision of um, these businesses. So do you think there are enough laws uh, to actually help protect these startups from being taken over um, by these investors who are actually the ones with the money? Well, gladly, or should we say luckily, we have not experienced, to the best of my knowledge, we have not experienced cases of hostile takeovers within the Nigerian ecosystem, tech ecosystem. We have experienced, we have seen mergers, we have seen acquisitions within the ecosystem, but we have not had cases of hostile takeovers. Do we have enough uh, laws and mechanisms in place to prevent such, I I would say there is more that needs to be done because we know that in the capital markets, for example, we have the investment and security stripe on. And so as much as tech investors, need, tech innovators need to be protected, the investors also need to be protected because we hear, we hear of cases where tech companies declare bankruptcy and they just fold up operations. And the question is, what do you, where do investors go? Normally now they would just resort to arbitration, arbitration, but it would be nice to have policies and mechanisms in place that will protect both the innovators, the tech innovators and the investors. I'm okay, still talking about um, patient capital. Now, um, sustainable growth is prioritized alongside financial returns, and that might take a while to achieve, and that would border on the patience of these investors, as the case may be. But then would a local sourcing of investments be more appropriate than seeking maybe foreign-based funding to help these startups achieve steady growth? I think it would be a mix of both. It would be a mix of both because... There is, there is an exposure that foreign capital gives you. There is a leverage that it gives you. It give, it's, and there is sort of a confidence, if I can put it that way, that it gives you. And so while we know that there is capital in-house, while we know that there is domestic capital that will also protect tech companies or local tech companies from, from currency devaluation shocks, 
we also know that having foreign capital will help will, with scaling up and expanding faster. Hmm. All right. Now, this next question has to do with you because, of course, you're a female and um, you should be in the know. Now, according to research, um, all female founding teams were responsible for about 4.9% of the total funding raised by African startups last year. Now, when these companies have at least one male co-founder, now the number increases to about 9.7%. So do you think that female founded startups are underfunded or you would say that their potential is not attractive enough for investments? Well, I'd say that they are underfunded and it would require it would require deliberate, deliberate action in funding female startups. The case is not, and the case is also not that their area of focus is not attractive to investors. I think it is just that the sector or the area where some of them play are not the fast moving areas if i can if i can use that term so it's not the payment services or financial or investment services platform for some not all but for some of them and so investors may be wary to to put their money in there and they would be wondering what is the profitability what will be the profit margin and so but it is not that it, so that is not for a lack of profits so it's not that there's no profit in those sectors. It is just that they want to they want to know what it is, and so that is why I say there is need for deliberate action in funding female female led startups. Hmm. And we have already started seeing some some move some move or some action in that line. And we hope that there can be more that can be done. All right. Now, of course, we know that Nigeria has a youthful population with um, creative sparks. So then um, when you look into the crystal ball, what do you think the future pretends for Nigeria's digital economy? Do you think it um, speaks of prosperity? Do you think it will drive inclusion? And do you think it can position um, Nigeria um, at the global level where other um, digital economies and other climes will be able to take Nigeria seriously and probably, uh, of course, want to partner with Nigeria um, in that sense. I think it's the phase, and so there is room for prosperity, there is room for growth. And so we are hoping that Nigeria, of course, with Dr. Bosu Tijani at the helm of affairs, we're hoping that it would be able to help Nigerian startups to scale. We were hoping that he would also have been in control of the NIMC so that, you know, all these things about identification and the different types of identification processes that Nigerians have to go through with the BVN and the NI and all of that. We were hoping that it would be able to merge that and we would even see some Nigerian startups, local startups play in the identity management space. So, and level that. So, but there is room for prosperity. There is room for growth. We have examples like India, like China and the US that we can model the startup ecosystem after. And we already know the numbers that the ecosystem in those countries are doing. And so the limit is wherever we, we decide to stay. Uh, so talking about um, modeling, of course, we know that um, Nigeria is a shining light, uh, topping the list when it comes to um, digital economy and uh, stake, uh, and uh, startups. Now, for other African countries like South Africa, Kenya, Angola, Rwanda, and the likes that have the potential, where do you think the learning curve could be for them when they look at Nigeria and you feel that they can um, learn from and, of course, imbibe uh, whatever it is that Nigeria is doing in terms of policies, investment drives, and initiatives that can help um, scale up and spread um, the startup ecosystem in Africa? One thing that other countries, other African countries can learn from the Nigerian tech ecosystem is building an ecosystem, actually. So you build one where it, it's, that promotes healthy competition. So we are not, it's not a shark, shark ecosystem where the large 
the large companies or the large startups are looking to swallow up the smaller ones. No, it is one where the Nigerian tech ecosystem is one where others are encouraged to gain, to gain skills, others are encouraged to innovate. And so that is one thing that other African countries can learn from the Nigerian tech ecosystem. Another thing that they could learn from the Nigerian ecosystem actually is not to focus so much on financial services and abandon or neglect the other sectors. Because we know that in a country there is much more, even though financial services and payments accounts for a, a large chunk of whatever sector, what in every sector is important in every sector. But we also we also know that uh, there are other sectors that can benefit from tech innovation. Uh, Lushe Yi Awujulu B, Senior Analyst, SBM Intelligence, thank you so much for this um, engagement that we've had with you. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Now, Nigeria's Minister of Communications, Innovation and Digital Economy, uh, Boson Tijani, said his ministry would establish an active sandbox environment to encourage and empower innovators and entrepreneurs to develop unique solutions for sectors considered to have limited exposure to technological innovation. So um, we just begin to wait and see um, what investments and, of course, if the government will be able to um, match words with action in terms of investments and policy just as um, our guest has said, to see how they can drive stability, drive funds and drive partnership into, um, the, into the country's uh, digital economy and see how growth can come to that um, particular sector. Now, um, we're going on a short break and when we return, we'll bring you international business stories. Don't go away. Mm -hmm.